Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the virtual March of Dimes High School Science Week. I'm Salk President Rusty Gage. For the past 30 years, the Salk Institute's had the pleasure of hosting this March of Dimes High School Week, a week where we invite high school students to tour our labs and meet with Salk scientists to show students a glimpse of what a day in the life of the scientist really looks like. While we're not able to invite students to our labs in person this year, we're thrilled to host you in a virtual lab tour. This week, we will have opportunity to interact with scientists from a wide variety of Salk labs, including my own, which will be featured on Thursday, as well as hear from a few of our esteemed faculty members. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our opening speaker, Dr. Jeff Wall. Dr. Jeff Wall is a professor in the Gene Expression Laboratory where his work focuses on better understanding cancer. Particularly, he focuses on breast cancer and pancreatic cancer in order to develop improved and more individualized therapies. And now to tell you more about the Salk Institute, about his lab work, and about uh, the work that he's doing uh, for the rest of us. World recognized leader in cancer research, Professor Jeff Wall. Welcome students. Thanks so much for joining us at High School Science Week at Salk. Uh, this is a great pleasure for me to present um, because I was actually, as I recall, the lead off speaker at the first High School Science Day at Salk uh, 31 years ago. Rusty, thanks so much for your very kind introduction. And today I'd like to talk about four things. First, I want to give you a brief introduction to the Salk because um, you're going to be visiting this week. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my background, and uh, I hope to impress upon you that any person who's inquisitive, who's interested in the world around you, regardless of your background, can become a science, a scientist. Huh? But to become a scientist, first you have to understand what science is, and I'll tell you what that is from my perspective. And then I'll tell you what my passion is, what I've been doing uh, since I've been at Salk. And basically, it's been doing cancer research, as uh, Rusty Gage said. And the uh, objective is to get foundational knowledge. Uh, I don't call it basic knowledge or basic science, but rather foundational, setting that great underpinning upon which subsequent work can be done because this generates the knowledge that's needed to improve people's lives. So uh, the Salk Institute uh, started by Jonas Salk uh, after he developed the polio vaccine, the March of Dimes gave him funding to start um, an institute that was a collaboration. The building of the institute was a collaboration between Jonas Salk, um, a scientist, a medical doctor, vaccinologist as he would call himself, in collaboration with the great architect, Louis Kahn. And this collaboration was to create the crucible in which foundational scientific discoveries would improve human health. So the way that they designed the building was one that has an open floor plan. You can go from one side of the building to the other without running in to, um, a dividing wall that's permanent. And Jonas Salk anticipated by many years what Franz Johansson called, uh, described in the Medici effect, the idea that the best ideas are born at the intersection of disciplines. So when you look at the work that's done at the Salk Institute, you can see that the uh, 52 faculty that we currently have are studying every important discipline in science that uh, is important for not only improving the health of people, but also of improving the health of the planet. For example, through our Harnessing Plants initiative, which is meant to uh, mitigate the effects of climate change by improving the ability of plants to capture carbon, a fascinating program. And of course, our cancer biology and neurobiology programs that uh, will, will attack two of the most important problems that have to do with an aging population. So we hope that we will follow 
Jonas Salk's admonition and advice that we must always do work where we realize that our greatest responsibility is to be wise ancestors. That is to think that what we are doing now, how it will have an impact on generations to come. So with that, I want to tell you about how I came to this point of being a scientist. Now, I grew up in a middle to lower middle class neighborhood in Los Angeles in the San Fernando Valley, not the good part of the San Fernando Valley. And my dad was a furniture salesman and my mom was a stay at home mom raising two children. And uh, my parents told me that I could go to any college that I could get into as long as I could live at home and pay my own way and that it should be in Los Angeles. And so that pretty much committed me to going to UCLA, which is a great school. Um, and I had a wonderful education there. And at UCLA, I had to work my way through college. I worked in a lab for two professors, both of whom had come from Harvard. And it was through their mentoring that they gave me the, the confidence that I could go from being a kid growing up in an average home with no scientific background, I could go from UCLA to one of the best uh, institutions in the world, Harvard University. That's where I went to do my graduate training. But my graduate mentor decided that it would be better for him to work somewhere other than Harvard. So he went to Salt Lake City, Utah, where I joined him as a graduate student in my third year. And I finished my training there and then went on to do postdoctoral studies at Stanford University. So from my modest roots in the San Fernando Valley, I went to a great college, to a terrific university, a set of terrific universities, and then ended up at the Salk Institute where I've been uh, my entire career since 1979. Now, one of the really great things about being a scientist is that you get to talk about your science to scientists who are located throughout the world. And so this picture shows some of the many places that I've been, but I think one of the most exciting places that I got to go to was Stockholm, Sweden in 2007, when my mentor, Dr. Mario Capecchi, uh, received the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for figuring out how to genetically engineer mice. Uh, if you want to read a fantastic, fascinating, empowering story about how you can go literally from being a street orphan to winning the Nobel Prize, read the story of Mario Capecchi, because that's his story. Now, I want to turn to the next topic about what is science. Uh, people have different uh, ways of thinking about it. I think about it as just a system for acquiring knowledge, where we use observation and experimentation to describe and explain natural phenomena that surround us, whether it be, you know, how plants grow the way they do, why we kill plants by giving them too much water why plants avoid shade. Why is it that people develop cancer? And how is it that we can treat cancers to give people better and longer lives? So through this system of acquiring knowledge, you learn how to formulate testable hypotheses. This is at the basis of the best science. And the best hypotheses are those that immediately suggest the experiments to test them. You'll understand this as I get into what kind of work we're doing in our lab. First issue is how do you decide which of the many possible questions you could imagine answering being empowered by this uh, scientific method to spend your time on? Now, for me, the answer was pretty straightforward because both of my parents died of cancer. That's what motivated me to spend my time 
studying cancer. And I wanna give you the example of breast cancer. It's one of the cancers we study in the lab, although the methods that we use could be used to study any cancer or in fact, any disease. Again, the power of science is it gives you ways of asking questions in a way that they can be answered. So why is it that we decided to study on breast cancer? Well, I think there are two important issues. One has to do with relevance, and the other has to do with feasibility. As you can see here by the statistics, in the United States, breast cancer is a worldwide problem. Let's just talk about the United States. About one in eight women, more than 10% of all women in the United States will develop breast cancer during their lifetime. This amounts to about 270 or 300,000 women a year developing breast cancer. And it's not just the disease related uh, that's, that's uh, present in women. About 1% of the cases will also be found in men. This results in about 40 to 45,000 deaths per year just from this one kind of cancer. Well, in order to understand uh, cancer and how to study it and assess this issue of feasibility, we have to understand the organ in which the cancer arises. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to bring up has to do with these statistics called five-year survival numbers. And the, the important point uh, here is that if a person is diagnosed with cancer in their early stages, breast cancer in their early stages, 99% or more will be able to survive at least five years. And this is if the cancer has stayed uh, in the breast, it hasn't gone to lymph nodes, it hasn't spread to other parts of the body. But if the cancer has gone outside of the breast, gone to the lymph node and spread to other parts of the body, then the five-year survival plummets to 28%. And this movement of the cancer cells from their a site of origin to distant parts of the body is called metastasis. So this problem of metastasis is what we really have to be addressing in order to improve lives of people uh, who have been diagnosed with cancer. Now, the, the mammary gland uh, is actually a pretty simple organ. Uh, it's designed to make milk, and there are just two types of cells uh, that comprise the mammary gland. There are these outer cells that are shown in red here called myoepithelial cells. They're muscle-like cells, and they're designed to squeeze out the milk uh, that is produced and secreted into this hollow space that's called the lumen. Now, the cells that make the milk are shown in green here. They're called luminal cells. So you'd think, well, breast cancer must be pretty simple. There are only two kinds of cells in the breast that can generate cancer, these basal cells or the luminal cells. That can't be too hard to study. Well, turns out the problem is more complicated than that. And because the problem is so complicated, you might recall that before President Obama left office, he empowered then Vice President Biden, now President Biden uh, with developing what was called the cancer moonshot. And this was an idea to get the best scientists in the world to work together in order to attack all of the many diseases that we lump together under this single name cancer. And the reason he empowered uh, President Biden to do that is because President Biden lost uh, his uh, oldest uh, son, Bo Biden, to glioblastoma, a form of brain cancer, one of the cancers that we work on here at the Salk Institute. Okay, so uh, here's this cancer moonshot. Uh, President Biden uh, now has uh, a lot of money in order to do that. Uh, are we gonna be able to do it? And is the moon shot the right metaphor? And I don't think it is because there's an elephant in the moon. Now, you know, to get to the moon was one thing. It's a planetary object. We know its trajectory. We know how far away it is. And we can use relatively simple math in order to uh, program a rocket in order to get there. And we've done that a number of times. Cancer is much more different, is much, is much different than the problem of getting to a known object at a fixed place in the universe. And I'll explain to you why. The problem has to do with this issue of tumor heterogeneity. So I told you that there are only two kinds of cells in the breast. Well, it turns out that if we look at individuals with breast cancer, we can identify many different kinds of breast cancer. Uh, 
and in part, they can be defined by the kinds of genes that drive the growth of the cells that produce those cancers. Now, we don't have to go into these various names. The importance of defining the cancers by the genes that are relevant to their growth is because that can suggest the kind of drugs that we can use to treat them most effectively. So those cancers that are driven by activation of these hormone receptors, um, we can use drugs that antagonize the activity of those hormone receptors, so-called anti-estrogens or aromatase inhibitors. These are, these are compounds that inhibit the production of estrogens. Well, there are other kinds of cancer that may not have these genes driving them. They may have another kind of gene. It's called HER2. It's a gene that's a growth factor receptor gene. Well, we have uh, many drugs that can inhibit the function of this growth factor receptor HER2. We can use those drugs to fight this kind of cancer called HER2 positive breast cancer. But then there's a significant number of breast cancers, about 20% of the total that are highly aggressive. They often form um, metastatic lesions, those kinds that really decrease overall survival. These are called triple negative cancers. And the reason for that is because they don't have any of these hormone receptors and they don't have HER2, so they're negative for all of these. And the only way that we can treat these cancers currently is using generally acting agents that we call chemotherapy. Now, these drugs can be effective for some period of time, but uh, often people relapse with very dangerous disease. Um, and also giving chemotherapy is associated often uh, with many kinds of side effects that are difficult for patients to tolerate. So we need to understand, we need to be able to give these triple negative cancers a name so that we can fight them with drugs that are much more to better tolerated by the patient. Now there's another problem um, and that has to do with the heterogeneity of cells, differences of cells within the cancer itself. Remember I told you about this kind of cancer that's driven by the HER2 protein. If we take three different sections of a single patient's cancer that was called HER2 positive, we can see that only this um, section in the middle is one that has cells that actually have elevated levels of the HER2 protein indicated by this kind of brownish reddish color. So what that would mean is that if we gave these people a drug that, that antagonizes HER2 called Herceptin, only the cells in this middle part would be sensitive to it. The cells in other parts of the cancer that don't have uh, expression of this gene, HER2, would be resistant. So it gives you the idea of cancers being composed of different kinds of cells. Some of the cells will be sensitive to the drugs that we give them, like Herceptin. Once Herceptin does a job, its job and eliminates those cells, new cells grow. So it's a problem of whack-a-mole. You get rid of some, other ones come back. So we really have to understand this issue of how is it that cancers develop the different kinds of cells that they contain? How is it that intratumoral heterogeneity arises? Because it's this intratumoral heterogeneity that creates an imprecision for even the most precise medicines that we currently have available. This gets to this issue of formulating hypotheses that suggest the ways, uh, the, the experiments, uh, to investigate them. And I'm not going to go into what the surgeon Francisco Durante said in 1874 about how cancers arise and how even um, cells of different types arise within the cancer. Basically, his idea was that cancers can be driven by inflammation. And if that inflammation lasts for a long period of time, it can cause the cells within the cancer to change uh, their look, kind of like how a chameleon changes its color. And we now call that uh, um, process cell state reprogramming. And he further said that these cells could change the way they behave to those, to the way that would resemble that found uh, in the most primitive cells of the organ that was affected by the cancer. In other words, the cells of an adult would reprogram to an embryonic state. In the case of the breast cancer, the breast cancer cells might reprogram to the cells found in the embryonic mammary gland. 
And these cells are very plastic. They're able to change because that's part of their normal developmental program. So he reasoned this could generate this intratumoral heterogeneity that he was able to observe just using a microscope. So his, his hypothesis suggests the following way of looking at breast cancer. We could just go through, uh, in this case, looking at mice, which we can study, and looking at different stages of the development of the mammary glands, starting in the embryo, going just past birth, and looking into the adult, and isolate cells from each stage of development, isolate individual cells, and determine what genes they express, and then ask, do cancers express genes that also relate to any of these stages of development? If uh, Durante's hypothesis is right, then at least some of the breast cancers or some of the cells in breast cancers would resemble those by their transcriptional programs that are present in these early embryonic stages. So we did that experiment and lo and behold, what we found is that these triple negative breast cancers, the kind that the pathologists have called the least differentiated, sure enough, resemble the cells that we found to be present at early stages of embryonic development, the cells that are most plastic and able to change in response to the environments in which they're placed. Now, then the next question becomes, well, what do we do with this information? Well, two postdocs in the lab at that time, Chris Dravis and Jay Young decided, well, cancer is a problem of the expression of genes and specifically the way that, that the chromatin, the DNA and how it's packaged to express genes actually expresses genes that are relevant to the cancer. So they looked for genes that were specifically expressed in the embryo that were also uh, expressed in these basal-like breast cancers. And they found a gene called SOX10, which we knew to be a master regulator of cell state due to the work of others. And what they also found was that this uh, master regulator is itself regulated by wound factors. That was interesting to us because we uh, knew uh, through the work of pathologists such as Hal Dvorak that cancer uh, looks like an ever healing wound that never heals. And what Chris and Jay and Nikki Lytle found was that when we exposed cells, either cancerous or normal, to these wound factors, and if they expressed high levels of SOX10, as they do in many of these basal-like breast cancers, the cells begin to move. They acquire this ability to move out of their normal environment to distant environments. That's the process of metastasis. And this answers the so what question. So what if we find that SOX10 causes this state change where the mammary cells change their state to become modal. Well, it turns out so SOX10 is a master regulator. It controls the expression of other genes. We look for other genes that it expresses, and we found that some of them um, encode proteins, say this one, KIT, which encodes a tyrosine kinase. This is the kind of protein that Tony Hunter has studied for so many years that these kinds of uh, genes are often found to be overexpressed or mutated in cancers, and many drugs have been developed against them. Turns out a drug has been developed against KIT, and it has been used therapeutically, although not for breast cancer. And we're, so now we're studying uh, these drugs uh, for new purposes, their ability to intercept metastatic disease. So by this foundational research that we've done, looking at cancer as a reflection of normal development and uh, influenced by inflammation and wound healing factors. We found new molecular drivers for metastatic disease. We are developing uh, new targets for the interception of metastatic disease. And we even think that we can use this knowledge to apply to the new field of immune therapy to use our harness our immune systems to fight against these dangerous cancers. So my take home lessons for today are Anybody can be a science if you're a scientist if you're naturally curious and you want to know how the natural world works. The scientific method teaches us how to ask questions in answerable ways and it's applicable to every discipline. Just because an idea is old, such as Durante's, 
doesn't mean that it has no merit. In fact, nobody had the ability to study that question until recently. And now we find that it has great relevance to not only breast, but many other cancers as, uh, as well. And if a, can if a hypothesis is testable, important, and will advance knowledge to improve human health, then we are obligated to test it, to be the wise ancestors that Jonas Salk told us to be. And finally, although I've talked to you about breast cancer, we found that many other cancers also reprise these embryonic programs to lead to this big problem, the elephant in the moon that is intratumoral heterogeneity. And now we're learning how to deal with it, intercept it, and um, improve the lives of people diagnosed with many forms of cancer. Now, this kind of work isn't done by me, certainly, not even by uh, a few people, but by many people. We have lab meetings. We've had them during COVID. This is how we had one lab meeting during COVID. Everybody uh, masking, socially distanced. This is our uh, mascot, a wallaby, uh, wall labby. Uh, and this is the way we usually celebrate on the patio at Salk that we hope that you'll visit at some point and see it in its true glory. And of course, we couldn't do this without adequate funding. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you have a great time visiting the Salk this week. Thank you so much, Dr. Wall, for sharing with us your research and your passion for science. We do have time for a student question. So our first question was submitted by a freshman and they would like to know, what do you think was your best learning experience? You know, I have to tell you that my best learning experience was my first failure. Um, science is often met with a lot of failure. Mother Nature is very smart. And um, what that failure taught me was to figure out whether uh, my hypothesis was wrong um, and urged me to think about new ways to test it or whether I had done the experiment wrong and the hypothesis was right. And that first failure taught me what I was really good at. And um, I hope that I've been able to transmit um, these abilities to understand whether the hypothesis is wrong or whether your approach is wrong and we need to try new approaches to address important questions. Excellent. I love that you highlight how important it is in science to recognize failure and really see it as an opportunity for growth rather than an opportunity to give up. So for students that have tuned in, thank you so much for joining us. Now you're going to have the opportunity to get to interact with some of the Wally Wall Labbies, as Jeff had mentioned. We're excited to welcome you into the lab for a virtual lab tour coming shortly. Thank you so much, everyone. See you soon.